Hello, my name is Josh Few, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Motion Picture Association, the Motion Picture Association of America, and how their rating system is severely flawed. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know, the MPAA um, was founded in 1968 by Jack Valenti and others as a non-mandatory movie rating service for the purpose of informing parents about what they're watching about what they're watching with their children. In theory, it sounds pretty good, but in practice, um, as I explain why why the MPAA is flawed, I'd like you to keep in mind uh, these questions. Uh, do the ratings um, that the MPAA assigns affect the director negatively in any way? Uh, does anyone understand the ratings and how they're assigned? And finally, finally does, the MP, uh, does anybody benefit from a system that refuses outside input. So on to my first question. Uh, do the ratings negatively uh, affect the directors? Yes, and to explain why, I want to discuss a major factor in why movies, uh, a major factor in why movies are made. Uh, money. Um, according to a study in 2006, uh, G-rated films produce um, at least 11 times, uh, on average, the profit of R-rated films, despite the fact that um, R-rated films outnumber G-rated uh, films uh, by 12 to 1. So in essence, the lower the, M uh, the MPAA rating and the more, the more accessible the movie is to a broader audience, it seems PG-13 is the sweet spot for movie makers uh, to reach the greatest audience, um, sure enough to draw in teens and adults while not serious enough to scare away uh, parents and children. So we see um, that the more accessible a movie is, um, the higher profit is generally going to make. But it also implies something else that we might overlook because of how obvious it is. Higher sales means higher views. And um, this means that the director wants his work to be seen by more people. And the director doesn't want, to, want his work to be seen by as many people as possible. He or she is going, going to have to push for as low a rating as possible for the type of film. And this leads us to the MPAA, the MPAA's role in the situation. They have final say on how a movie is rated. Sure, you can appeal the rating, but if you want a lower rating, you're generally going to have to edit the movie to remove some of the offending content. Um, in essence, this gives the MPAA minimal directorial control over how a movie is made. Um, you can't ignore the MPAA and go unrated, or uh, just take the NC-17, for example, because uh, that'll greatly affect uh, a movie's ability to be either displayed in theaters or sold in stores. Um, but enough about directors. Uh, ratings are done for parents, right? Well, maybe. One of the major issues with the rating system employed by the MPAA is the lack of clarity. Sure, they tell you a movie is violent or has foul language, but they don't explicitly state what actually happens in the movie. Uh, many parents want to know what exactly is going on in the movie so they can judge whether it's appropriate for their children. But all you're left with is a vague idea of some of the offending content. Um, if you're trying to determine whether or not a movie is okay for your children, you need to know what happens in the context of why it happens to be able to make a good judgment on whether you know it's a good movie to see. For, as an example, we have a documentary uh, called Bully, which was released uh, two years ago, I believe, and uh, it's about bullies. Despite it being a uh, uh, bullying being a pretty common problem among children and teenagers today. When it was first sent to the MPAA, it was given an R rating, uh, effectively barring those who would most benefit from watching this movie uh, from getting a chance to see it. And after some public pressure, the, uh, the rating was changed by the MPAA to a PG-13 after the director moved the F word three times uh, from the film. And so, um, we see um, uh, just kind of a, a disparity that there's um we don't um okay only a few form uh anyways back to the point only a few former raiders for the MPAA have spoken out against it and going into detail about how the movies are rated. Jay Landers, one such member, spoke out in the documentary. This uh, documentary, this film is not yet rated, stating that no clear cut standards are used. And my example about the bully kind of shows that. that the movie can change its rating because it removes three three curse words. Then the 
the standards uh, or the lack of standards are obvious. Uh, without the standards, we have no idea whether or not these ratings are based solely upon opinion or for what reason a rating is given, and thus we don't know if the ratings are actually beneficial to parents. But at least they use experts and are accountable for their ratings, right? Unfortunately, this isn't the case. The MPA raters are kept anonymous, and ratings are done on a by the parents, for the parents basis. Supposedly, the raters are parents themselves. But being completely anonymous, we have no idea whether this is true or not. We have uh, a bunch of anonymous raters with whom we may or may not share values on what we deem appropriate, who are unaccountable to anyone but themselves. What's worse is what we do know about the raters, though. Uh, Jack Valenti himself um, has stated he doesn't have any child behavioral experts on that panel and that he just wants ordinary people uh, involved in the rating process. Arguably, the people best suited to determining whether or not specific content is harmful to children are completely absent from the, from the rating board. So, to sum up the issues with the MPAA, we have a completely anonymous board of parents with no training in determining what is harmful to children, arguably the main focus of the MPAA. Um, we have an unclear rating system with no standard with which to rate the movies, all while being completely obtuse and failing to inform parents about what they're actually getting into when they take their child to see a movie. And finally, all of these untrained, unaccountable raters have a huge impact on how well a movie does in theaters, as well as how the final product is presented. Um, it should be clear by now that the MPA is ineffectual it's only at its only job and is severely flawed. All right, Josh, at the beginning, I think what you've got is a series of questions, and it might work well in an essay, but for an oral presentation, let's stick with the answers and make your claims clear. Uh, otherwise, I think you, you do have an argument here, and you outline it pretty well, but like I said, the phrasing is just a little bit awkward. Um, I didn't think that the transitions in the body of the speech were as clear as they were at the beginning of the presentation. However, at the end of the speech, when you summarized the argument, I thought you did a pretty good job reminding us of what things were, so I don't think anybody's going to get lost. Uh, the proof on the first point about the influence of the MPAA and uh, the ratings on uh, finances, uh, there are some presuppositions in here that need uh, development. For instance, you suggest that the MPAA becomes a de facto part of the directorial process. Uh, you know, the, the, I'm sure that their argument on this or their response to this would be they are simply rating the film and it's the um, studio and the director who are the ones who are concerned with the rating. They, you know, they are the ones who are concerned with marketing it and that's why they want those uh, kinds of things. The, you know, if it gets a, an NC-17 or an R rating, um, the MPAA is perfectly happy if it goes out that way. The problem seems to be more with the uh, people who are financing the movie or the directors who want a particular rating here. So there's a, there's a cause-effect claim that you're making here that I think needs a little bit more development. Um, the other thing that you make an argument about that says that the MPA's ratings can't be ignored and you make an argument that they can't get into theaters or into stores and I didn't hear any evidence that said that that was true I don't doubt that there's probably some information that suggests that that's true but it's what it's not part of this speech and so that's I think a little bit problematic uh, now the specific criticisms of the MPAA and the way it does its rating I think that uh, you raise some legitimate issues about uh, who the members are and whether or not they have expertise <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the MPAA's position seems to be that expertise is not the point, that they're approaching it from the general position <coughs> of parents. Um, and the only example that you have that really gives us any detail on this is bully, and it's basically, uh, you know, the use of uh, the language that seems to have created the R rating. By the way, um, it... it you know, an R rating doesn't keep people from seeing the film. It keeps people from seeing the film without their parents, right? So the argument here has to be that this restricted the access to the audience 
because the parents didn't want the kids to see the movie or they didn't want to go with their kids to see the movie and there's got to be some explanation about why that is uh, a bad thing as opposed to uh, the kids having access to the movie because it's PG-13. Um, you know, I, I, it's, I, I think it's an interesting idea. And by the way, wasn't the, you know, if the movie's made available, and I, I remember this controversy on this, wasn't this movie made available widely in other contexts as well? So if that's the case, how is the theater rating is important? And that's your only example, and I think you need a little uh, more information on that particular point. Like I said at the end of the speech, I thought there was a really good summary of the argument, though, and you did a, a pretty good job providing source citations for most of the information.